Uh, what questions do you have? Yeah, I'll work for you. You know, I think I still have another homework that I haven't graded. <laughs> I'll get that done. <laughs> I forgot about it until just now. Sorry about that. It's what I do. I forget things. I'm pretty good at it. No questions? Things are going okay? All right. So we just started talking about ideals last time. So I do several examples of those, do some properties of ideals, and then talk about how we can create new rings from old rings using ideals, and then connect the ideas of homomorphism and ideals together. Okay. So that's kind of where we're headed. Probably won't get through all of that today, but that's kind of where we're headed towards. So I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up as far as that goes. All right, so uh, we were working on this example last time, talked a little bit about it. Uh, we've got our big ring is polynomials with integer coefficients, and then our ideal is this strange looking notation that I threw up there. I just mentioned what was going on in each piece again. So just to remind, that set of polynomials. This just means multiply all the polynomials by x. So what does that do the constant term again? Get rid of it, right? So this is just any polynomial that has no constant term at all, or a zero constant term, I should say. And then this, if I ignore that side, that's just the even integers. So if I want to add those two things together, what am I making? Yeah, make a polynomial with even constant terms, right? So this is, the only things here are constant, and I'm adding on to the things that have zero constants. So I'm making pol I'm making polynomials where the coefficients can be anything you want, integers, but anything you can want. But the constant term has to be even. So in some sense, this ideal is half of the ring. The other half being polynomials that have odd. Uh, constant term, if you will. I mean, they're both infinite, but kind of think of it as splitting it into two pieces that are kind of the same size. All right. So anyway, uh, if we want to show that this is an ideal, probably the easiest way to write an element in this ideal, and this is the reason why I wrote it this way, I want to talk about an ideal that has an even constant term and then anything I want for the other one. So I could probably, probably the easiest way to write it would be, um, say, two times, I'll call it n plus um, x f of x in i, where n is an integer and f of x is in z of x. Probably, I, again, you can write it in lots of different ways, but the lots of different ways would, I think, involve writing it with more words, right? I could write a polynomial like you always write a polynomial, except that then you would have to say that your constant term is even and then the coefficients can be any integers that you want. This is probably just a shorter way to write it. And algebraically, it's probably a little bit easier to deal with. So remember that if we want to show something as an ideal, we need to show two things, right? We have to show that it's closed under subtraction, and we have to show that it absorbs multiplication. So it's like your subring test. Remember when we talked about subrings? It was closed under subtraction, closed under multiplication. We just get that little extra piece for multiplication. It's not just, it's closed under multiplication and also absorbs other multiplication, right? So to show that it's closed under subtraction, let me write, well, we've got one element in I. Let me just change it slightly. I'll make it an N1 and an F1. And then do another one. I'll make it N2 and F2.
So I want to show that it's under a sub <coughs> pardon me, closed under subtraction. Basically, I just want to make sure that when I subtract two things of that form, I get something that looks like that form, right? So if I take 2n1 plus x f1 of x minus 2n2 plus x f2 of x, how can I rearrange that and see that that's back in the ideal again? Yep, yep, exactly. So what would it look like after you combine your like terms? Good. Yep. Basically, we're just combining like terms. That was why I wrote it that way, right? Because, like I said, algebraically, it makes this a little bit nicer. You agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Certainly, your n one minus n two is some integer, and your f one of x minus f of uh, f two of x is some polynomial. So now I've got a polynomial with even co uh, even constant terms. So I really do get that that's back in the ideal again because it has the right form. Now we need to show that it absorbs multiplication. All right. So that means that if we let I'll call it g of x be anything in R. In this case, our R was our uh, polynomials over Z. So polynomials with integer coefficients. That's usually, uh, by the way, it's um, a little bit shorter way to say that. I said polynomials over Z, so that just means polynomials with integer coefficients. If you say polynomials over R, it just means that your uh, coefficients for the polynomial come from the ring. It's just a faster way to say it. So if I say it that way, that's what I mean. I slip into more convenient words than I go because I do research in the area. So <laughs> when I say the words, I want to make sure you know what I mean. All right. So to show that it absorbs multiplication, I want to take this g of x, multiply it by the, uh, polyn the other polynomial that we have that comes from i, and then show that it lands back in i again. It certainly lands back in r again. That's not an issue because it's a ring. It's closed under multiplication. But I need to show that it absorbs it, right? So if I take g of x times 2n1 plus x f1 of x, and just using the first one doesn't matter, we can distribute. Why is that back in I again? Well, again, the defining characteristic for being an I is that it's a polynomial with an even constant term, right? Does this polynomial here have a constant term? The one that I underlined? No, because we took the polynomial and multiplied it by an X, right? So it would have bumped everything up by a degree, right? So there is no constant term here. What about this one? What can I say about the constant on that one? Mm -hmm. It's even. Because I'm going to take every coefficient and multiply it by an even number, so I get an even, uh, even constant term. So that means that this is really back in I again, which is what we wanted to show. So, so that really is an ideal.
Are there questions about what we did with there? We're going to do more examples. This is literally this is not going to be the only example we do today. I am going to talk about a connection of this to some other concept of the way we generate other ideals, but um, we are going to do lots of examples today with these. Is this okay? Now I do want to I mention something here that's a little bit different. Notice I specifically wrote this to get even constant term, but we could have any other um, polynomial we wanted, or sorry, any other coefficient that we wanted, as long as it wasn't the constant term, right? We could use any coefficient for x, x squared, x cubed, and so on. But for the constant term, we want to make sure we had it even. That was what we used. What do you think, goodness, that was a squeak. What do you think I would have meant by, if I would have written it this way? Um, instead. What do you think that would mean instead if I wrote it that way? Yeah, even integer coefficient. That's exactly right. So that would be a little bit different, right? This is every coefficient is even. That would require a little bit more work to show that that's um, closed under multiplication in particular, because multiplication of polynomials is a little bit more difficult, isn't it? Than just addition of polynomials is just add like terms, right? Just combine the x's, find the constants, combine the x's, combine the x squared, and so on. So showing that's closed under subtraction is not hard because, not as hard, because when you subtract, you just subtract the coefficients and even minus even is going to be even, right? But multiplication is a little bit more difficult. If you want to show that I have a polynomial here times another polynomial here, Do you multiply polynomials basically component-wise? Do you just multiply the constants and then just multiply the x's and multiply the x squareds? Is that how you multiply polynomials? No. <laughs> right? Everything has to get distributed to everything else, correct? So I, want, I basically want to talk about a shorthand way to write the product. That's why I'm doing it this way. <laughs> so, and then I'll go back and I'll tie it back to that example. So notice that if you multiply this together, certainly I do just multiply the constant terms together, right? What's going to be the coefficient on the x term? What will be your coefficient on your x term when you multiply that out? Would it help if I wrote down with numbers first and then go back to the letters? Yeah. Okay. Say I wanted to multiply those two things together. Sorry, was on. You're good. <laughs> Constant's easy, right? Yeah. What about the x's? How do we get the x? Uh, it's five, right? Five x. Is it three times five x just a two x minus? No, it's, I lied. <laughs> Agreed. Minus, you lied. Minus two x. <laughs> Thirteen x. Okay. So I got to take this constant times that x term. And that uh, that x term is that constant, right? So I wrote it out longhand, three times.
times 5 minus 2 times 1 times x, right? How would you get the x squared? I do negative 2 times 5 equals 8. So yeah, so you have, I gotta do 3 times the negative 6, right? So I do the constant times the x squared. And then 8 times 2 equals x squared. So, yeah, so I got the 8 and the 1, and then the, the 2 and the 5 also get in there, right? And then, um, what was I say, the 8 and the 1? Okay, and we have to keep going that way, right? So notice when I write your x coefficient here, <clears throat> pardon me, we have to do what? We have to do a1 b0 plus a0 b1 over here. Because I do the constant times, oops, I did it backwards. Oh, I wrote it backwards, but that's fine. I got to do the a naught and the b one, and I've got to do the a one and the b naught, right? I probably should have really did it around. You agree? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> pardon me. When we do the x squared term, what would that look like? Good. Over here, let's do the x cubed term. How would you get x cubed out of this one? A one equals a one b two. Well, let's let's look at our example first, and then we're going to go back to this. You're you're right. What you're saying with the symbols. Yeah. Yeah, so I know that this three doesn't have anything to pair up anymore, does it? So at some point the con at some point we're gonna run out of things to pair. But we still can do an x times an x squared. What else can you do? Eight and five. Eight and five or and Yeah, it's just the one and the one, right? I can still get it to go that way, can't I? All right, so let me start labeling some things here and then work back over here. So this is this is A naught, A1, A2, A3. This would be B naught, B1, B2. Right? So this would be a naught b naught, and this is x to the zero, isn't it? This is a naught b one a one b naught. I think we have it written that way. And then likewise, um, a naught b two, a one b one, a two b naught. And over here we had to do a one b two, a two b one. A3, B0, because we didn't have a constant term that worked anymore, right? Okay. However, second, first, second, third, okay. What do you notice about the subscript in the degree of the term? What's the calling? They add up, right? So, even though I can't just say we start at A naught and end at D whatever, when we do it, we can come up with a formula, a way, a little bit more symbolic way to write it by looking at the sum of the things. So, well, the way we can write it is that the coefficient on your x to the k coefficient will be a summation. It's hard to say where you're going to start and end. Because notice when you do the x to the fourth term next, 
you'd have to start at 2, right? The only way we can get an x to the fourth is if I do 8x squared and 6x squared and x cubed and 5x. All right, we're starting to run out of terms. So the best way we could write this is say something like um, when we do, how do I write this again? Um, um, I want my, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. I want my i plus j to equal k and then write it as a sub i b sub j. That's what I want to write. I want to make sure the sum of the subscripts add up to the degree I'm looking for. A lot of times when you see this written, you see this written as, if I have a start with A's and B's, typically you see this is written as a C sub K. In that fashion. Anyway, hopefully this <laughs> helps us with figuring out why we would have an ideal, why this would be closed under multiplication. So again, if it's going to be closed under multiplication, you need to take any polynomial times anything in the ideal. But you just agreed earlier that that set is the thing that has even coefficients for every coefficient, right? So what can I say about all of these products? If all say all the b's are even, what can I say about those? All those products they are going to be. Even if you add them all up, you'll get an even, right? So this is knowing that that's how the x coefficient or the x to the k coefficient comes out. That's how we would show that that thing is closed under multiplication or absorbs multiplication. I mean, because it doesn't matter what the a's are, as long as the b's are even, a's times b's will give you an even, and sums of evens is even. Um, again, it helps to have the formula in that case rather than trying to multiply it all out. Because we already saw that multiplying it all out, we have issues with trying to keep track of the subscripts. It's just a lot easier to say, hey, we only worry about the subscripts that add up to the degree we're looking for. And then go from there. And not have to try to write it out explicitly. Does that make sense? I know it's a little ugly, but... If, it, if, we, if you know what the formula is, then it makes the argument a little bit easier. Because now I see, oh, even times anything is even, sums of even is even, so I have even coefficients. And we're done. In any event, looking back at the previous two examples, we now have two different ideals. I'm trying to shrink it back where I can see the other one. We have two different ideals. We have this one. And we have this one. Certainly, that particular ideal, the 2z of x, is contained in the ideal that's just i, right? That has even constant terms. The i one's bigger, right? There are things that are in i that aren't in that other one. Right? i just says, just says the only restriction is the coefficient has to, the constant has to be even. This one said, the second one says that all of the coefficients have to be even. So it's a smaller one. The reason why I'm emphasizing that is we're going to come up with a concept of what we refer to as a maximal ideal later on. So in particular, this ideal can't be maximal because it's properly contained in another ideal. It's smaller than the other one, so it can't be a maximal ideal. This is why I'm mentioning it. Questions about that? I know there's a lot of symbols. <laughs> Questions about that at all? Okay. So um, let's try to go back to some more straightforward examples, if you will. This was probably a little bit harder, but I wanted to introduce some of the concepts that we're going to be uh, running up against later. So let's let's try to take a little bit more, still a little bit abstract, but a little bit easier idea. So these are what are referred to as principal ideals. 
rather than getting the definition, we've already seen some of these. We've given them notations. We're going to give it a slightly different notation. So we've talked about this ideal. Just 2z, right? There's a way we can generate this ideal just by using one element. And what I mean by that is this is the set of 2 times x, where x is any integer, right? Let's take all the integers and double them. That's another way to think about it, right? Take all the integers and double it. So we can think of this as being what we refer to as generated by the element 2. So generally speaking, if R is, we're going to start with a commutative ring with identity. Oops. Then the principle, uh, oh, uh, I'll write it this way. Then the principal ideal generated by an element R in R is exactly what you would think it would be. The other one is the, so we said the ideal generated by two in the integers is take every integer and multiply it by two. So if I want the ideal generated by R in capital R, what do you think we would, what set do you think we would make? If the ideal generated by 2 is just take 2 times every single x in z, how do you think we would make the ideal generated by r in capital R? Yeah. I agree. That's it. That's what the principal ideal would be. Uh, we'll talk here in a minute about why I need a commutative ring with identity. <laughs> We'll do the with identity part first and then the commutative ring. There's a notation for this. Of course there's a notation for this because why wouldn't there be? We use parentheses around the single element. That's the ideal generated by R. The principal, I know we say the principal ideal generated by R. Principle because it's generated by one element. Okay. All right. So let's look at a couple of examples. Let's say it asks us to find all the principal ideals. Uh, let's do. Z15. Let's do the easy ones first. There's a very, very easy one. The easiest one is that one. I want the ideal generated by zero. Well, zero times anything is zero. So this is just the set zero. We refer to that as a trivial ideal. Even though my B looks like a U, trivial ideal. We've talked about that ideal. It's a principal ideal. It's always a principal ideal because the zero ideal can be generated by zero. So, not very interesting. Let's do the other easy case. What would be the ideal generated by one?
Well, it's not quite but it's zero through four peak. Oh, yeah, zero yeah. Peak. yeah, 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 exactly. So this is all of the ring, right? It's all those even feet. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> that was why I said these are the first two easy cases. Okay. Yeah. Great. Cool. So far, so good. Okay. Let's do another one. That's I'm not gonna. Go, I'm not gonna do two next. Uh, I could do two next. Yeah. Um. And let's do three next, and then I'll go back to two. What would be your ideal generated by three? I, I would expect that you're just brute forcing this, by the way. I would not expect that you're doing it in some fancy way. Six is in there, I agree. Nine is in there, yeah, I agree. Multiples, yeah, of three. Yeah, so what would, what would be the five elements that are in here? Yeah, that's it. Because it, so you do zero, one, two, three, four. Five gets you back to zero again. Three times six is eighteen, but that's three. Three times seven is twenty-one, but that's six, and so on. Right? It just cycles around three times. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me ask you this one then. What's the ideal generated by six? That's three of them. That happens when you do six times three. It's the same, it's the same yeah, because six times three is 18, but that's three. Six times four is 24, but that's nine. It ends up being the exact same ideal. Good. Do you have any guesses of what other two elements might generate the same ideal? Nine and 12. Yeah, I agree. You can check it. Right now, the only way we have to do this is brute force, right? We're literally just going through and doing all the multiples. We will have better ways of generating these things. But right now, literally, it's just brute force. Is this okay? Is that making sense? I hope. I hope. I hope. Okay. Let's do five next. And then we'll do then we'll do the rest because there's an important piece that we want to notice for the rest of them. What do you get when you do the ideal generated by five? Yes, I would agree. It is just zero five ten. Five, yeah, so five times zero is zero, five times one is five, five times two is 10, five times three is 15, you're back to zero, right? And then five times four is 20, which gives you five, and so it just starts cycling around again. It's actually not too hard to see that it starts cycling, by the way. We said that five times three is zero, five times four would be five times three plus one, right? And you distribute your five through the five times three is zero, so we just get the five back again. And five times five would be three plus two, so it's the same thing as five times two. And you get back to the zero. So you'd be a little bit clever when you're doing your computations. Any guesses on what the ideal generated by 10 might be? The same, yep. I said that there will be other ways to notice why this is true. We're not there yet, but let me give you a little bit of a hint. What's the GCD of 3 and 15? Three. 
3. What's the GCD of 6 and 15? And 9 and 15? And 12 and 15? Ah, how about 5 and 15? 5 and 10 and 15? 5. They have the same GCD. And they're generating the same ideals. We'll come back. This is that's more of a group theory result than it is a ring theory result, so we'll come back to that later. I <laughs> keep saying that. Just keep pushing it off till later. It's fine. We got plenty of time. I said, last your brain's gonna be a ball. All right. Is it okay? What are we missing? We're missing two, four, seven, eight, eleven, thirteen, fourteen. Is that right? Okay. What's the GCD of 2 and 15, 4 and 15, and so on up the line? One. one. Okay. Any guesses on what ideal, based on what we did for the other ones, any guesses on what that might generate when you do those? It's going to be the whole thing again. So let's think about why. So this will be 2 and 4 and 7 and... Eight, oops, and eleven, and thirteen, and fourteen. But it did that without any computation at all. And in these, I, I know we haven't talked about the GCD thing enough to know why that's true. However, we do know enough about the other stuff to know that why, if they're relatively prime, then it generates the whole ring. We get the whole ring. Okay. Here's why. What's 2 times 8 in Z mod 15? 1. What's 4 times 4 in Z mod 15? Also 1, right? What do we call those types of elements when they when you find something where you can multiply them together to get 1? What do we give what name do we get those types of elements? Yeah. Units, right? 2, 4, 7, 8, 11, 13, 14 are all units in Z mod 15 because their GCD is 1. We've talked about that before, right? Okay. So the set of the units, and we remember we use U of to talk about the units. The set of units are 1, 2, 4, 7, 8, 11, 13, and 14. What happens when a unit gets in your ideal? That's the important thing. What happens when a unit gets in an ideal? And this isn't anything special about principal ideals. This is just this is just generally speaking. What happens if a unit gets in there? Okay, well, let's think about again the two important properties of pardon me, of units. Or not units, of ideals. I'm playing stuck on unit. Two important properties of ideals. Closed under subtraction absorbs multiplication. Okay. So if U is a unit and U is in the ideal. Anytime I write a capital I, assume I'm talking about an ideal. Because right. that one actually worked quite nicely. Ideal starts with the letter I. So that one works out well. All right. If a unit is in there, then what other element has to be in there? Now think about the absorbing of multiplication. If you and and in particular, there's a special element that, has to, that I want to talk about being in the ideal. If U is in there and the ideal absorbs multiplication, what might I want to multiply U by to get a special element to be in the ideal? I'm going to use the word special on purpose, but it absorbs multiplication. So what special thing, what special element do you think I'm talking about if I'm talking about units? So that's part of it. Is it what we're going to say? Inverse, right? So if I multiply the unit by its inverse, what do I get? One. I get the multiplicative identity, right? So 
u inverse times u is in the ideal because it absorbs multiplication, right? If u is in the ideal, then u inverse times u is in the ideal, or the multiplicative identity is in the ideal. Once the multiplicative identity gets in the ideal, and you have multiplication absorption, what happens now? If the identity is in your ideal, what happens? What happened here? What happened up there in that case? The identity was... Is just the ring. There's the whole ring, right? Once the identity is in there, the whole ring is in there, and the identity just blows up and becomes the entire ring. So this is why we knew, without doing any work, this is why we knew each of these principal ideals had to be the entire ring. We know from before, from the work that we've done before, any number that's relatively prime to the z mod n that you're working with, any number that's relatively prime is a unit. So if you do the principal ideal generated by a unit, it just blows up and becomes the entire ring. So I know you can do the, all of those with no work if you know that they're relatively prime. The other ones right now, we literally just have to do some plug and shut kind of ideas. But with the units, you don't have to do any plug and chug. If it's a unit, you know it's going to be the whole ring. And by the way, we, we did, we're doing, talking about principal ideals right this second, but this is true for any ideal. If a unit gets in there, it's the whole ring. Okay? Does that make sense? So let's do another example that goes along those same lines. This is number 12 on page 149. This one's a little bit shorter because there aren't as many elements. This one's asking you to list the principal ideals of Z2 cross Z3. Easy case first. You can always take the easy case first. Do the ideal generated by the zero element. What does that have to be? Yeah, this just has to be zero, zero. Good. That one's always the easy one. One good constant about math is that even though we change lots of, it feels like we change the rules. <laughs> Somebody I worked with a long time ago says that um, sometimes some people think that, think that in math you're basically trying to play a game with a kindergartner. Just as soon as you figure out the game, they change the rules. <laughs> Feels that way a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it's pretty fair, isn't it? Okay. This is, this is one of those that that rule never gets changed, right? If you say zero, zero times anything is zero. That one doesn't get changed. Okay. Now, I might change what one times one is. But I'm not going to change what zero times anything is. Okay. All right. So anyway, that one's always easy. Do the principal ideal generated by the zero element, you get zero. Okay. The other ones we said were the easy cases were if you can talk about the units. Okay. Well, one unit is the multiplicative identity. In a direct product, what do you have to use for the multiplicative identity? Yeah, one, one, right? It has to be the multiplicative identity from the first ring and the multiplicative identity from the second ring, right? So if I have the multiplicative identity, then I get the whole ring. I'm not going to write out the elements. It's just the whole ring. But we also know that if we do any other unit, it will also be the whole ring. Well, if you're going to be a unit in a direct product, what has to be true about each component? If it's going to be a unit in a direct product, what has to be true about each component? They each have to be units in their respective rings, right? So in Z2, 
Well, there's only two elements. What's your only unit in Z2? One. What are the units in Z3? One and two, right? Okay. They're both fields. They're very small fields, but they're both fields, right? Field of two elements, field of three elements. So not only is one one a unit, what's the other unit in Z2 cross Z3? One, two, yeah. So that'll be the same principle ideal there. Okay. So we have three other elements to worry about. We got one, zero. Let's just think about how you would generate it. Well, certainly, no matter what ideal I'm talking about, there's an element that has to be in that ideal no matter what, right? What element has to be in every single ideal no matter what? Doesn't matter the ring, doesn't matter the ideal. There's a one element that always has to be in every single ideal. What, what, remember, ideals multiply, uh, absorb multiplication. And I just told you that no matter what you do in math, there's one constant all the time. Yeah, zero is going to be in there, right? It has to absorb multiplication by zero, which gives you zero, right? So the zero element always has to be in there, no matter what. No matter what ideal you're talking about, the zero element always has to be in there. We talked about that with subrings, right? Where subrings is zero element, that'd be in there too. Okay. All right. Let's think about another. I want to tie this back to the definition. I promised you that I was going to tie back to the definition in a little bit. Was I said, we'll take care of what happens if we don't have an identity. I'm going to tie that back here in a second. If you talk about an ideal being generated by an element, what would you expect to be true about that element? If I'm talking about an ideal generated by that element, what other element would you like, besides zero, would you like to be in that ideal? That element, right? The element that's doing the generating, right? Well, certainly one zero is in here because I can just do one zero times one one. I have an identity, right? I do one zero times itself. Uh, does any other element end up in here? No. Because the only choices you have for a first component are one and zero, right? If I use a zero for the first component, I get zero, zero when I do the multiplication. If I use a one for the first component, I get one, zero for the multiplication. So that's it. These are the only two elements that are in here. I don't think there are any other, oops, any other elements that generate that same ideal. So let's switch over to zero, one. Tell me two elements for certain that are in here without even doing any work. Yep, zero, zero and zero, one, good. I think there's one more element in here. Zero, two is in there, right? Because I can take zero, two times zero, zero, or zero, one. I mean, zero, two times zero, one will give me zero, one, or zero. Zero two, I mean. Can't talk. All right. So what other element generates that same ideal, do you think? Zero two does. And you can check that it really does. Oops. Notice it looks like I'm writing that a little bit weird with the double set of parentheses. There's a reason why. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Not later. We'll talk about that today. <laughs> okay. Are we okay with generating ideals by one element? Okay. Well, let's talk about what happens if you lose identity. If you lose your identity, that would be bad, right? Oh, lost something. Dude, Abbott, that's what yep. made me just yep. chuckle. <laughs> What's There's that? A SpongeBob once. episode. He goes, I lost something once. And then it just pauses and he goes, My identity. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> We had Matthew. I'm so glad that you got that. I just want to check. No, the second he said that, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. We had Matthew shirts once that said, "Join a group, have an identity." Oh, <laughs> I, like that. I thought that was pretty funny. 
All right. So what happens if you don't have an identity? Okay. So for example, what's our what kind of what's our, uh, our prototypical ring that we've dealt with that doesn't have an identity? Butyl. Matrices are the ones we do for non commutative. Yep, 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 that's good. That's kind of I'm glad it popped your head. Because yeah. we're going to do an example of matrices here in a little bit. What ring have we used quite a bit, even talked about today, that um, doesn't have an identity? 2z, yeah, yeah, let's just use 2z. So if our ring is 2z, and I want the ideal in 2z generated by 2, what do I end up with? Not in the integers. I want the ideal in 2z. What do I end up with? Because remember, when I do the principal ideal generated by an element, I've got to take the elements in the ring times the thing that's doing the generating. What do I end up with here? So these are the things, these are the things that I'm allowed to multiply by the two. What do I end up with? Well, tell me one for one for certain you know is in there, no matter what the ideal is. Zero. Okay, good. Get that out of the way. Okay. Can I multiply by one if I'm taking my elements from two Z? Well, you just told me that two Z doesn't have an identity. So can I multiply by one? No. So, in particular, is 2 going to be in the ideal generated by 2? No. What am I going to end up with in this particular ring? I'm going to shut that door so we're going to be starting to ring. Thank you. Yep. What do we end up with? Where would you, why do you think that? Because it can't be, like, two can't be in there. So, so what would be the kind of this next smallest thing that would be in there? Four. Okay, and then you would get six and so on, right? Yeah, you would have, what's interesting is, if I do zero and four would be in there, and then I could, but six wouldn't work, but eight would be in there, right? Because there's not a three in there either, correct? I end up with what? Multiples of four instead of multiples of instead of multiples of two. All right? That's not satisfying, is it? In particular, what did I just say a little bit ago? If you're talking about an ideal being generated by an element, what element in particular besides zero would you expect to be in there? That element, right? That doesn't, that, so the de same definition for principal ideal doesn't work if we don't have an identity. So to make it work, if R, oops, if R is still commutative without identity, then we define the principal ideal generated by R as Still all multiples of R, but we also do all possible sums of R with itself. That was weird. Remember that this NR notation just means we're going to add R to itself that many times. This, no matter what the x is, if I do x is 0, use n as 1, that gets r in this principal ideal generated by r. So not only do you get all ring multiples of r, you also get all integral multiples of r, which means you get all, all the summands of r with itself that many times. I know that one's a little weird. We're not going to do a lot with this, but this is why that first definition came up with identity. 
If you don't have identity, you can get this thing, which is very unsatisfying. At least I find it unsatisfying. Of course, I'm an algebraist, which makes me weird to start with. But again, if you say I'm generating something by this element, I would expect that element to be in there. All right? So we make an adjustment with the definition if we don't have an identity. Now notice if you do have an identity, I don't need that definition, right? Because if I have an identity, then R gets in there automatically. And then once R is in there, it's closed under sums. It's an ideal, it has to be closed under sums. So every R added to itself so many times has to be back in there again. I know that was a little weird, I'm sorry. Let's do a matrix example since Alexis brought it up. So it's so Alexis's fault. This is actually example seven. I'm going to do example seven in the book, um, which is on page 143. I don't typically, I like to do the book homework problems, but not the examples because I figure you can go read the examples. But I want to see why this is a problem um, with principal ideals. Okay. Um, in particular, uh, the way the definition worked. Let's say that I use doesn't matter what um, ring I'm in. Let's just say that this is my matrix that I'm trying to, oh, I guess I should have used brackets. I used parentheses in the book, sorry. If you, if you prefer brackets on your matrix rather than parentheses, that's what that is. I just copied, I wasn't thinking of the copy that out of the book. In any event, doesn't matter what the ring is. A and B are ring elements. Think of them as integers, think of them as real numbers. It doesn't matter what they are, okay? If we try to do all of the multiples of that thing, so thinking about it as just the set of all matrices in there, notice that when it's not commutative anymore, certainly if I multiply by any um, W, X, Y, Z on the left, we're okay, because you get what? W, A plus X, B, and zero, you get Y, A plus Z, B, and zero, don't we? Let's back in there again. We agree with that? But what happens if you flip your um, matrices around? Can you get something of the same form again if you flip your matrices around? No, you get what? You get A, W in the upper left, A, X in the upper right, B, W, and B, X. All right? Does that, make, does that match the same form again? No. So, in particular, if I just look at the set of all matrices, that have zeros down the column, then that's not closed. It doesn't absorb multiplication from the right. It does absorb multiplication from the left. And I think I mentioned this the other day that we have the idea of an, a left ideal. This would be a left ideal. It absorbs left multiplication, but it does not absorb right multiplication. meaning multiplication on the right, not correct multiplication. <laughs> All right, so what does that tell me about this definition for principal ideal? Remember, principal ideal, again, the definition looked like, I wrote it this way, but of course for commutative rings, I could have written it that way, right? Wouldn't matter if it's commutative. Would this same definition for principal ideal work if your matrix is not commutative? 
Or did you make it? So if your ring was not muted, well then no, because this doesn't work, right? It's not giving me the right thing. So, well, at least it doesn't look like what you would expect it to. So if your matrix is not commute, or excuse me, gosh darn it, if your ring is not commutative, the general definition for the principal ideal generated by R is this. This handles all cases. You want to you make sure you multiply on the right by everything and on the left by everything and make sure that R is in there. And then, again, it has to be closed under sums and differences, so I need to be able to add all of those things together. That is ugly, right? That's not the best, note, that's not the best definition of something, is it? But this is how you define, generally speaking, what an ideal generated by an element is. Here's the good news. I'm not ever going to make you do that. Okay. If you can understand enough why, if we don't have an identity, that the element that's doing the generating is not in there, I'm happy. Okay. But this things go haywire when you go over to non-computative rings. I could imagine doing something like a true-false question by saying, in any ring, here's the definition of the principal ideal, and just have it like this, and you'd have to tell me it's false. Right. It only works for commutative rings of identity. Does that make sense? I can see that, but not anything more than that, as far as worrying about weird cases, if you will. Okay. All right. We bump this up a little bit to generating not just by a single element, but by, by multiple elements. So let's again, and in this case, we're not going to do any weird cases. Commutative with identity is what our overarching range is going to be, okay? Because we're going to start multiplying, we're going to start generating by more than just one element. You know, it just get crazy by the time you try to do all the different pieces that you need. So let's let R be a, com bless you, commutative ring with identity. I lost something once. Now I'm going to have to watch that clip because it cracks me up. Then the ideal oops, generated by, let's say, R1, R2, out to Rn in R is... It looks like a big, long tuple. It's not a big, long tuple. This notation is an ideal that's generated by these elements. Okay? So context matters if you're talking about these things. This is, <clears throat> pardon me, the set of all... R1, X1, plus R2, X2, plus, 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 Rn, Xn, where your X sub I's come from R. When we can write an idea, this is an ideal. You can check it, it's not too hard. Certainly if I subtract, then I would just do like Masana said earlier today. If I subtract two elements that are in the ideal, then I just do like combining like terms, right? Because your R1, R2, and Rn don't change. So if you subtract two things, just combine the terms. And it certainly is going to absorb ring multiplication because if I multiply by something, I can just stick it with the x's. I'm going to have R1 times something plus R2 times something because I want all the line. It's not hard to show that this is an ideal. Okay. 
When we have this finite list of elements in here, we say this is a finite, ge finitely generated ideal. You can have infinitely, infinitely generated ideals. However, even though in calculus you talk about power series and doing infinite sums, we don't do any honest to goodness trying to compute limits in arbitrary rings to do an infinite sum. So even if you have an infinitely generated ring, you still only use a finite number of them at any time to generate the sum. The sum will always stop as a finite sum. Your R's might change for what you use in the sum if it's infinitely generated, but we never, we never do more than a finite sum. In algebra, you play with power series, but only as the algebraic op objects. You don't ever actually worry about whether they converge or diverge. We just play with them as stuff to play with. We refer to them as po formal power series. We don't care about conversions or divergence. Okay. Anyway, this is what we mean by a finitely generated ideal. So let's go back to the example we talked about at the beginning of class. The example we talked about at the beginning of class was integer, uh, sorry, uh, polynomial, polynomials over the integers. And we said that the ideal was same set of polynomials, but with even constant terms. I claim that this is the same thing as the ideal generated by x and 2. Sometimes this is referred to as being doubly, into, uh, doubly generated, generated or 2 generated. You don't have to worry about that necessarily, but you might see those words. Well, if you ever go on to another algebra book, you might see those words. <laughs> I know some of you were chomping at the bit to go do that, too. In any event, why is this true? So this says, according to what we just said for finitely generated, this would be the set of all x times some polynomial plus 2 times some other polynomial where the polynomials f and g are coming from r. Isn't that exactly what we said we could write everything in that ideal before? Yeah. So we really do get this finitely generated ideal, this two generated ideal, if you will. Okay. The ideal generated by two elements. I also claim that I can't generate this by a single polynomial. It's not a principal ideal. Right. In particular, if I tried any f of x and tried to generate it, I would have issues with trying to get, say, 2, <laughs> for instance. Right? If I try to take any, um, so certainly 2 is in this ideal. Right? If I take any f of x and try to multiply by something and get 2, my f, my, um, my f of x would have to be 2 or negative 2. And then the thing I multiply by would be 1 or negative 1. So I could get it. So 2 has to be my generator, except that I can't get x from 2. I can't multiply 2 by something and get just a single x. So I can't get both. I can't get 1 from the other. So I really do have to use both generators. So this is this can't be a principal ideal, but it is a two generated ideal. Let's say uh, generated by two elements. Why might we care about doing things with generators? Well, of course, if I want to try to talk about something in general for this entire ideal, it's a lot easier to deal with a finite list of things that generate the ideal than trying to just pick something arbitrary out of there. That's one of the reasons why we care about generators. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So.
let me go ahead and stop because I only have four minutes and the next stuff that we're going to talk about is going to take a lot longer than four minutes. So, <laughs> okay. So let me give you some uh, problems to work on for homework. Um, let's say this, this starts on page oh, 148. Uh, let's do practice. I'll put some practice and some ones to turn in. I didn't think about which ones I want to do for which as I'm going along here. Um, practice three and six, definitely. I want to see eight. Um, ten is, should be pretty short. Um, I'm going to turn it 17 and 18. I want to do that one later myself. Um, and 27. Okay. Let's do that to start with. I might add a few more to that for next time, but there's a couple of other concepts I want to talk about uh, before we go into the next section. Um, in particular, if you get a chance to, I know it's not due for a week, but if you can look at, and I just, of course, shut my book and tell you which problem. If you can look at 27 before next class, okay, that's going to pop up. So, <laughs> yep. All right. Have a good one. Thank See you. ya. Are you going to watch SpongeBob?